All right, good evening, everybody. Uh, my name is David Plyler. I'm a music specialist at the Library of Congress, and I am super excited about tonight's concert. Uh, this is a double bill for our annual Founders Day concert that takes place on October 30th of each year on the uh, birthday of Elizabeth Sprague Coolidge, who is kind of our founding patron, as we know, and to whom we owe, owe this concert series that we have. Um, so tonight's double bill, we have the Quince and the Talk ensembles. And uh, with me, uh, I have Amanda DeVore Bartlett from Quince. Um, I have next to me Charlotte Mundy uh, from Talk and Laura Cox from Talk. And so we are uh, I'm super excited about this program for a number of reasons, and I'm gonna get them to talk about it. Um, but one of them is that we get to hear music by composers who we may not have heard much music of before if you're not uh, familiar with kind of what's going on uh, with this type of uh, repertoire. And one of the reasons that we may not be as familiar with it is because these are unique types of ensembles. And so uh, I think that what we'll do is maybe talk a bit about, can I go back and forth and talk a bit about uh, how you come up with the repertoire that you do and so forth. So maybe we can start uh, with talk. Um, maybe you can tell us a bit about your ensemble, how you came into being, and what the process has been about getting repertoire for this music ensemble. Um, yeah, so Talk was founded in kind of an interesting manner. A lot of groups come together and they're like, I want to be a string quartet, or I'm really excited about being a, a woodwind quintet. And Talk came to be because we were really excited about each other as people and as musicians. Um, and we kind of treated the instrumentation as something secondary to the, the mutual musical understandings that we had and our respect for each other as people and our, our joy in working with each other as people. Um, so in the cultivation of our repertoire, that's something that stands as well. Um, a lot of the composers that we work with, we have really long-standing relationships with. Um, three of the composers on... Um, our half of the pieces tonight are people who we've worked with on multiple occasions. I think one of them we have, we were counting in the car, seven pieces from, um, and that's Taylor Brook. Um, and we also have a whole album of his work. So we, we cultivate these really kind of long-standing, in-depth relationships with the composers that inform both our practice as we continue and also their compositional practices they keep working. So, you know, for us, that's one of the most special things about our existence and the way we do repertoire. Maybe you can tell them a bit about what that instrumentation is, uh, just because of the novice. Oh, yeah. It's a voice, flute, clarinet, violin, and percussion. And uh, it turns out to be a really beautiful instrumentation, too, even though we weren't really considering that. Yeah. <laughs> We'll come to the specific pieces here shortly, but what about uh, Quince? What's, give us yeah, a I think we, we share a similar ethos to talk in that we came together because we were interested in each other as people. We're four treble voices, three sopranos and one mezzo. We met in graduate school and we're interested in vocal music that wasn't just storytelling and, and wasn't just about sounding like pretty angels. We wanted to explore the range of colors of the voice and, and the possibilities with the voice outside of the sort of iconic, um, the, the icon of what the singer is supposed to be in society. So that's something that we came together in. There's actually not a lot of repertoire for treble vocal ensemble. The repertoire that does exist is for girls choir usually. And so it's, it's not necessarily, it, it's often very beautiful, but it's not always very musically challenging and it's written for young voices. Um, not necessarily full-blown opera singer <laughs> voices, which we're all trained in opera. So we've commissioned a lot of repertoire also, and we have a very close relationship with the composers we work with as well, and we want them to push the limits of, of what the voice represents um, sonically and metaphorically. So one thing I've noticed with, um, you know, so I'm hearing some of these pieces for the first time tonight. Uh, you'll, some of these are, are world premieres that you'll hear tonight. And I was just hearing some of them for the first time um, in bits and pieces in the rehearsals. And so one of the things that struck me about both groups is that there's an element of, um, like I would almost call it, instead of like a personal virtuosity, like just an ensemble virtuosity that's required to, uh, there's such intricate writing that, that requires a virtuosic ensemble in order to actually pull it off. And it was being pulled off in a spectacular fashion, I think. 
um, and there's a lot of different uh, stylistic variety as well, but um, you know, maybe going back to talk, uh, maybe you can say a bit about um, how you approach <laughs> the integration of the voice into this instrumental ensemble. It's a great question for Charlotte. <laughs> She's our vocalist. That's, yeah, how do we approach it? That's an interesting question. We just, um, I mean, I as a singer am really interested in finding as many different colors as I can uh, with my voice. And um, I really, it helps to play with people for many years in a row and learn how they sound. And I feel like it's really affected my technique to sing all the time with a violin and a flute and a clarinet and try to blend with them. I think it, it it's just about repetition and time. Yeah. And we often, we often play pieces that don't have text that really treat the instrument or the voice as an instrument. Um, yeah. There also seems to be some there also seems to be some uh, uh, additional component that uh, where often the other, at least it sounded to me, and maybe this is an illusion, but it sounded to me like the other members of the ensemble were also uh, making sounds with their voices That's as true, well. That's true, yeah, that happens a lot, singing into instruments and, yeah. yeah. And so that seems to be kind of like a, I don't know, equalizing force or something like that. Is at least my ear. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. Yeah, that's astute. <laughs> um, there's an element of that as well. So you have a, with Quince, there's a wide variety also of styles of, of music that you do. I know you've been, uh, I think I've heard the Sariajo to Lang or something like mm -hmm. that. So there's kind of this uh, big difference. Is there <coughs> any fundamental uh, approach that you take or do you just treat each piece as a, its own yeah, each piece does require its own acoustic consideration. The folk music that we're doing, we're working with resonance in a totally different way. What we're trying to do is psychically connect <laughs> with the other members or really stare at their mouths and try to imitate the mouth shapes. We're four very different voices, so trying to blend with each other has been its own very microscopic acrobatic exercise in our larynx and and it's very interesting to to work with them versus singing solo mystically and some people I don't know if you've experienced this Charlotte I'm talking across the across the divide the questioner yeah. divide here <laughs> but sometimes people don't consider vocal music chamber music and this is something that we run up against you're either the soloist mm -hmm. or you're a choir mm -hmm. and they but we really are thinking like chamber musicians we're thinking about cues we're thinking up about breathing together and our own versions of up bow, down bow, like string players use, we use as singers for consonants and, and things like that. So mm -hmm. we're, th we're thinking like a string quartet, really. I definitely, you definitely sense, I think that you will, everybody watching you will see that <coughs> sense of movement in both groups about how, it, how that <coughs> communication is happening. It's definitely not hidden. Um, so that, that'll be fun to watch as well, is just, just to see. Maybe we can talk a bit about uh, some of the specific pieces that we have. I know that we have a few of the composers, uh, we th I think a few of the composers are gonna be here tonight, uh, including Federico Garcia de Castro, who's here, um, so hello. And if you have questions at the end, we can also ask him uh, just so, so you know. Um, maybe we can uh, say a th few things about what, what brought us to s use to select these particular pieces for this program, uh, maybe starting with talk. Yeah. yeah. Um, I think, these particular pieces, I think there's a, a, a many-fold explanation for why these particular pieces. I think one of them um, is that these are all pieces that we care about very deeply. These are pieces that we have um, performed several times, the composers of which are, are people that we, we very much cherish as friends and as colleagues. Um, but I think from like a more programming type of um, angle for looking at why we chose these pieces. There's, there are some, some things that bring them all together and it's kind of actually what we were just talking about with regards to chamber music and like, are you a soloist or what kind of blend is it that you're making and how are you like creeping the people across from you to try to, to match and work with them. Um, all of the pieces that we have tonight with um, some exceptions uh, in little moments of the pieces uh, are really kind of about creating some sort of 
um, amalgam or some sort of uh, synthesized space where we all really access similar colors or similar ideas and, and become kind of one instrument together as the ensemble. Um, so there, there's actually a piece that we're playing called Amalgam, which is why that word was probably on the tip of my tongue, but um, you'll hear that really explicitly in that piece and as the composer kind of explores what that means, how to move away from it, how to come back into it. Um, in David Bird's series and posture, you'll hear a lot of things too, where the instruments are kind of occupying this same space and there's something really crunchy about it, like what, a, what, what gets problematized when we're all in that same very small space. Um, and Aaron Gee's mouthpiece 28 um, kind of builds this weird, like, you know, alien, non-meaning vocal language for Charlotte, um, out of which the rest of our parts are really extrapolated to lift her up, but also, in doing so, lift all of us up as a singular unit. I agree with that. <laughs> <laughs> I, this is a, a question for both. I mean, uh, how do you handle issues of endurance? I mean, especially for a full vocal quartet and things that this, um, this music is so um, demanding that uh, I just uh, imagine that it's, uh, is that maybe something that also goes into that process of selection? I or think, just go for it? <laughs> yes. I think that goes into the process of selection, but perhaps not necessarily in the way that we envision when we think about like, oh, this is going to be demanding, what do we do? I think the five of us are kind of like, oh, this is going to be demanding, score. <laughs> like, you know, if it's, if something about it is going to like make you feel a little physically uncomfortable because of the effort that you have to put in to execute it, there's something really exciting about that. And like, you know, you turn up that dial in terms of virtuosity, whether it's technical virtuosity or like the physical virtuosity necessary to execute a whole program of this kind of music, you know, there's a real beauty in that, that the cusp where, where does that, you know, where do you get cut off there, so. You know, one, one nice, um, there's, so there is some contrast actually in, it's not just the quintet and the quartet. Um, there's one piece that, um, uh, that Laura, and Charlotte are doing together um, by Kate Soper that I'm very pleased is on here. Um, and maybe you can say a little bit about that piece in particular, because this is a, a duet kind of in the midst of the. Yeah. Um, so that's a piece called Only the Words Themselves Mean What They Say, and the text is by Lydia Davis. And um, it's one of the few pieces that we're playing that has a text. Um, it comes from a larger cycle of Kate Soper's called Ipsa Dixit, which is kind of all about attempting to use language and logic to understand life and the world and in the end kind of failing to. And so this movement, it is logical, but it's also very emotional. And there are a lot of noisy sounds that I get to make. And speaking of endurance, it's like there are sounds that I make in the performance that I won't make in rehearsal because I can only do it once or twice a day without really like um, doing a little bit of damage. So it's a very exciting piece in that way because it gets to be really gritty. Um, and yeah, that's that piece. It's very <laughs> it's uh, it's super fun to get to play it with Laura. I love. We were just reading the program notes, and Kate Soper says the flute becomes like an Iron Man suit for the voice, which is like, <laughs> I, which is just lovely. Yeah. <laughs> I, it kind of um, it's. I, I do think that just from what I was hearing in rehearsal, there is this element of uh, a unified sound. You get this real sense of a meta instrument that mm -hmm. gets kind of put together, both with that piece and also with your other pieces or with the larger. Ensemble, so it's really it's really impressive. I think it's going to be exciting to play. Um, Amanda, I'm wondering if you could tell us a bit about uh, some of the works that you're doing. What makes these? Um, uh, forgive me, but quintessential pieces. <laughs> oh, uh, that's it. I'm <laughs> no, that's great. Um, well, we when we were originally talking to you, David, about the program. Um, I think that the thing that we were originally united on was the Dust Bowl project. I'll talk a bit about that. We, we are developing an, a concert length program around themes of the Dust Bowl, drawing a lot of inspiration from Woody Guthrie and, and the Dust Bowl, his Dust Bowl ballads. Um, we're telling stories of our own grandparents and, and this is the first time that we're really composing for ourselves, writing original songs and, and also arranging songs. Um, and, and what I think ties the Guthrie set, the Dust Bowl set, sorry, to the Guild Alliance and, and um, 
Federico's piece and the other pieces on the program is um, Quince loves drama, and we try to keep it out of our personal lives and on stage <laughs> for the most part. Right? They're very, they're all very dramatic pieces, whether that's in the traditional sense like comedy, tragedy, or in a an ac acoustic drama. Federico's piece, for example, is very dramatic, and he took a lot of risk with it in terms of the sonic palette. It goes from zero to 180, back to you know all these different kinds of sonic experiences. In the Dust Bowl set, we're telling telling stories. In, in the David Lang, it's this the, the old old school sort of um, folk ballad in, in its own in its own way. And so that's something that I think draws it together is the the drama of all the pieces. How big is the, the Dust Bowl set project as a whole once it's finished? Or it'll it be about, yeah, it'll be close to an hour of music. Um, we're, we're still arranging some pieces. It, if you've ever worked with the Woody Guthrie estate, you know that it can be kind of a, a process <laughs> getting the rights to do things, which is understandable because everyone wants to set his music. Um, so we're getting working through that. We'll also be telling stories as part of that performance. Um, so the, the, whole, the whole performance will be around an hour when we have the whole thing. Do you have plans to record that? Yes. Or, oh, great. Yeah, we do. <laughs> um, maybe, can you tell us a bit, a bit more about Federico's piece? Just the, uh, so it's in four movements. Mm -hmm. Are there um, uh, any particular things we should be listening for? And I hate that question, actually. But no, I think that's a good question for this piece because I think some of the sounds, uh, I love the, what you talked about with the amalgam of the ensemble. Some, I think some of the sounds are so tight-knit with the voices that you don't necessarily know what's happening. We're doing these very nasalized, bright um, sounds that em emphasize the overtones a little bit and, and start to sound, I don't know, like a, a group of bugs in your ear or something. It depend you, you can interpret that how you want, but we're really nasalizing and going for this very gritty sound there. Um, and then it, it takes these kind of gritty sound mass, clustery things, uh, and then in the end quotes Scarlatti, <laughs> because why not? So it turns, it turns from this um, amorphous subjective voice soup, I'll call it, uh, into this very recognizable chanson song. Interesting. Uh, the, um, well, we're looking forward to hearing it. This will be our first time for <laughs> most of us. World so, premiere, uh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, um, that's always the exciting thing about these. Uh, so, um, <laughs> there you go. Sta sta stating the obvious is my one of my <laughs> chief uh, attributes that I'm good at. Um, <laughs> but uh, I think I, I don't want to keep uh, keep everybody too long just so they can have a chance to rest and get ready for the performance. But I would like to talk um, before we go to questions from the audience, if there are any. Um, I would love to, to hear about what some of your other projects are that you're working on right now, maybe some upcoming things that you're thinking about, and so maybe you can start with that. Um, the one piece that we're playing by Ashkan Bazadi Dezeo on the program, we just recently gave the American premiere of the entire cycle, which it's from. He said a whole, he wrote like an hour of 45 minutes of music. For us, all setting poems by Federico Garcia Lorca, um, and that's a gorgeous, lush, dark, mysterious kind of sound world that we're working on. <laughs> yeah, and there's um, there's kind of a recording project down the line with Ashkan's song cycle. He keeps he keeps threatening to add more movements, so we'll see if that happens and then maybe deal with recording following that. Um, one of the things that we're doing this year, this, um, this season and the coming one in the spring that is really exciting to me is we're doing a lot of um, work with different academic institutions, which is one of my favorite things about the job that we have. Um, you know, we spend a lot of time looking out for composers that are really exciting for us and, um, you know, continuing the exciting relationships that we have with the people that we know. Um, but getting time to spend with students whose voices are still forming, but whose works are, you know, regardless of any sort of age or training, generally incredibly mature is a really, is a really immense privilege. So this year we're, um, we're doing residencies at um, Stanford, Cornell, Boston University, Delian Academy, which is kind of like a um, coming together of composers from around the world in the summer, and somewhere else, right? St. Oh, Cloud. yeah, Penn. Yeah, and St. Cloud State University. So, um, I mean, that's, that's one of my favorite things 
there's always a lot going on, but it's nice to be able to sit down with people who are like working on something for you and are so, you know, they're students, they're humble, they're excited, they're coming to you and they're asking like questions about like, is this possible? And you're like, let's find out. <laughs> and that's like, that's my favorite mode, one of my favorite modes to be in, so yeah. Well, I have a, this kind of brings up a question for, for both of you. I know that you, uh, both ensembles rather, have um, experience working with students and doing, I'm assuming, doing reading sessions and things mm -hmm. like that. When it's such uh, specialized instrumentation or things that require a great deal of preparation, how do you, um, wh is there a different approach that you have when looking at a piece that is basically gonna be sight reading or close to sight reading versus uh, do, you know, nurturing a relationship with a composer over time? How do you handle those situations? It always strikes me as kind of a, I know people do it all the time and they do, do it really well, but um, mm -hmm. how do you approach that? Do you do, do it with an aim to, uh, just give composers a sense without damaging anybody <laughs> in the <laughs> process of reading. Bleak. Well, one thing that, that we do that I, um, that I think is really like something that I'm quite proud of talk for doing is we don't, um, we always rehearse before reading sessions. We rehearse the things we're reading. Um, and this is not so that like, you know, I mean partially I'm sure it's the, so we don't do the thing where like, you know, you show up and you sound crummy or something, but also like, you know, um, the students have put their hearts into these pieces and I feel like it's important to show up and really give them back, or at least try to give them back the amount of effort that they've put into preparing the score for you. So we always um, you know, take some time with it beforehand, but I guess the question remains of what do you do with that first, that first reading, I don't know. Yeah, I agree that it's imp it feels so important to me to give a decent rendering of whatever they've written because having composed a tiny bit myself, I know that feeling of like hearing other people read through your piece. It's like, it's really scary and it's really like a precious moment. Um, but so I don't, I try not to do anything differently. Like I always want to respect what the composer has written and just try and render it the way I think that they want to hear it. Plus, yeah. it always ends up on the internet. Yeah, so it's true. Yeah. Better practice. It's true. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's a great answer, especially for uh, composers who are writing for you. So that's, that's yeah. great. Um, what about upcoming projects and events for Clint? Yeah, well, we're working on the Dust Bowl project. The full um, set will be premiered in May in New York. Um, and we're going to be recording the full uh, cycle of love uh, called Love Fail by David Lang, and we'll be recording that next spring. We just released an album last year called Motherland, um, which we're still touring some of that repertoire, and some of that is happening tonight. Um, we were recently in a documentary um, about Morton Feldman's Three Voices, and we were talking about recording. That's a lot of recording, a lot of touring. Um, is there one bitter member of the group? Oh, we're all four going to be in the recording because, <laughs> <laughs> because it's such a it's such an exhausting it's such an exhausting piece. Mm -hmm. If you, it's forty five minutes with no pauses <laughs> for the voices, so we we mm -hmm. we're going to share the love <laughs> on that one for sure. And then we're we're premiering a new opera in May in, in Pittsburgh, so that'll be fun. Which uh, who's the composer? Curtis Rumrill. Yeah, it's going to be really exciting. It's uh, he writes all these operas about. Um, these animals <laughs> doing strange things, like sort of personified <laughs> animals in a way. And, and in this one, all the animals have disappeared. So some humans have to be the pets because there, there's no more pets. And, and so there's like these, these weird sort of power relationships between people and some of the, some members of Quince are gonna be playing the pets and some will be playing the humans. It's, 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 wow. it's, it's way more serious than I'm making it sound right now. So <laughs> stay tuned. <laughs> Um, well, uh, why don't we, if, are there any questions from the audience that we could, I mean, if you don't mind waiting for a microphone, I think we get, um, it's coming. <laughs> um, sort of related to what David asked a minute ago, um, and specifically about vocal music. I've always been curious with the, with this really, you know, cutting edge kind of vocal music where you know it's, you don't obviously you don't just have a score with some words and notes over them, but when a with a new piece like this, does the composer really have to 
sit down with you to convey what kind of sounds are needed. I mean, it's not like, you know, a piano, you write the notes, you play the notes, you can play them harder or softer, but there's just so much variation in what the voice does. Yeah. <laughs> really just, how does question. that work? It's a really good <laughs> exactly. question. Exactly. We just texted Federico yesterday and we're like, um, did you mean this or this? And sent him a text with a picture of the score. <laughs> and it, we're really lucky to be able to talk to the composers. Mm -hmm. And and it's a lot it's a lot of discussion. It's interesting though, I think it sometimes it depends on the composer because some I mean it's common to have like a key at the beginning of a score saying this is the symbol, th the weird symbol that you see in the score, and here's what I mean by it. And some composers, I think, are almost interested to see what will happen if they leave it a little bit open, and some composers have very specific <laughs> expectations. So it's like, I agree, it's always nice to talk to the, to the composer about their intentions, but yeah, it does depend on There's the situation. There's some repertoire that Charlotte and I both sing, which is really fun, because <laughs> it's, it's nice to hear a recording and say, oh, wow. Her voice does something totally different there, and it's not necessarily a different interpretation. It's just that our voices are a little different. Mm -hmm. so that's that's what's really cool about new repertoires to hear different people interpreting. Yeah, yeah. exactly. I think uh, what you're also hitting on though is a notational problem that is so when the composer is no longer there to ask, mm -hmm. what do you do? And there's um, different approaches that some people have taken. Like you have, like the case of Helmut Lachenmann, who would uh, I, I believe he was making. Um, like some DVD or you know, videotape recordings of how to make the weird th sounds on the on the string instruments. That, but he's, he wants a very precise thing, and sometimes the best way is just to show it yeah. and yeah. hear it. And I wonder, um, have ever, do you do that? Like uh, I guess by skyping or just um, you know, the, those types of interactions, or just basic. All of the above. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yes. and, uh, it is good to see it sometimes. Composers are they documenting that for you know to allow that to be part of the score? Is that something that they ever? I think sometimes, I think, um, you know, sometimes you'll interact with a composer and you'll be like, oh, this, this one thing isn't clear and something, 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 and then they, they revise the score and you're like, oh my gosh, it's, it's beautiful, it's a, it makes sense now. Sometimes, you know, you see the version of the score like three years later and it, it's completely mystifying once again. So I think it really varies. <laughs> Thanks. If you're will, can you hear me? Yeah. If you're willing to answer this question, how did each ensemble get its name? <laughs> can I go first? We were a quintet, <laughs> <laughs> and then one of the persons decided that music was not for them, and they work at a bank. <laughs> we kept the name. <laughs> it wasn't a, a celebration. We didn't want to change it to courts. <laughs> and we we spent this whole oh my gosh I wish I had it we spent this whole night trying to come up with other names and they all ended up being super new age like hippie names and we just couldn't let that be in the world <laughs> so we kept coins I think somewhere in like the deep archived email recesses I have like a similar yeah. sad thread about <laughs> our naming process definitely it got like yeah. really bleak for a bit um, and really long, too. It, it really wouldn't have been functional long names. Um, but talk uh, means a bunch of different things in several different languages. Um, but the, the two most um, alluring meanings for us are that um, it, it means both yes and thank you, um, which are both very, like, you know, full of possibility kind of words, like, oh, what's going to happen next? Very affirming and positive, yeah. Thank you. I think I've seen that both uh, Quince and Talk have done performances that will involve some type of video projection or at least some type of mixed media. Mm -hmm. So I've wondered as musicians, what are the, some of the special challenges as well as some of the, the benefits to working with mixed media instead yeah. of just a stage performance where you're performing as a musician? When? Oh, go ahead. Uh, well, it is challenging. You need to find someone who you trust to run the electronics, and that's not always easy. We're lucky to have some collaborators who are willing to help us with that and who are really good at it. But And I think it's interesting because if you, when you have a huge screen behind you with like beautiful visuals going on, sometimes that can really take away from the music. 
Um, so it, it, it's a thing that I think people are still learning how to do, like how to incorporate projections into performances without making it overwhelming and making it about the projection. We had a really, um, this past spring, we had the great pleasure of premiering three new um, kind of musical theater, a term I'm gonna use very loosely here. They were pieces that had music and were theatrical, yeah. period. Music theater. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, and all of the composers, and they were all you know, very dif different sources of vast different ideas of what media could even be represented. You know, one of them, you were like wandering down this staircase while you were watching it, it ended up in this basement full of candles, and one of them had like people dancing in like spacesuits, and there's, I don't know. So, it was great. Um, but they all, they all approached how to deal with our um, performance logistics very differently. And I'll just share like one hilarious anecdote, which was we, for one of the pieces, never had like a, a full score that would tell us what to do at any given time. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we'd be in rehearsal and the composer's trying to work us through and he's like, 2H, let's start from 2H. And we're just like, we don't have 2H. And he's like, oh, 2H is like where the people in the back start blowing up the balloons and singing the song about the restaurant from the 50s. And we're like, what? But we didn't have the information because was, there wasn't a universal score, right? So we had to make some very specific demands about the information that we needed. Um, and I think most of the, what it ends up being for us is just like properly, or properly in terms of whatever that means for the given situation, conveying um, what we need to know to kind of route where we are and what we need to do at any given time. Yeah, yeah but that being said, when we watched the video after, turned out really cool yeah. so it's like that's also the benefit of working with mixed media is like there's so much possibility yeah. for expression yeah yeah I, yeah, I would say it, it working with electronic we haven't done a lot with projections but we do a lot with electronics just projected sound and it's like learning another instrument because sometimes they're, they're using these complicated computer softwares to trigger all the different sounds so we spend so much emotional and mental energy trying to get that to work and all the gremlins and the cables to you know, just scare them off that <laughs> I feel like I haven't gotten good at enough at it to think about the music properly when we're... Yeah. But it's something we try to get better at it all the time because it can be really cool. Yeah. Do, you, do you do media yourself? Are you a media artist? Or? No. no. <laughs> Seriously, seriously. Sometimes I think we've done concerts that have things that's a lot of media and it's complicated, fireworks everywhere, and then we'll follow that with a very stark, simple, unaccompanied acoustic piece, and that piece, the acoustic piece, ends up being more startling because we're so used to dense, complicated electronic sounds now. All the pop music we hear, everything is processed with so hundreds of layers for a song that you're hearing over horrible radio speakers in your car. Everything has all these layers all the time. And so to hear something with just the instruments themselves, that can be the more yeah, impactful thing if, yeah. yeah. I'm wondering, uh, just before we break, uh, since we have Federico here, um, maybe we could just, a I could just ask you to say a few words about your piece. Uh, it's just a, it's always a pleasure to have the composer uh, with us. Um, so if, if you don't mind just saying uh, a few things about the piece and also about just your, your process of working uh, with, with the ensemble. Sure. Yeah, thank, thank you for, for asking. I was just realizing how much I, I uh, over a month and a half of, of really um, intense work in, in uh, 2017, I thought of all of you guys <laughs> <laughs> all the time, every day, every moment. Uh, of course, thinking of the first audience, or in, in general the audience, but I, I, I realized that uh, that's uh, us now, <laughs> including me, <laughs> right? I don't know what the, uh, what, um, you never know what the final effect of, of what you're writing is. In fact, I've, I've, I've come to realize that if you do, then it's pro pro probably not worth going to the trouble of <laughs> carrying it through, right? Um, so I'm, I'm as curious as, as everyone here uh, about the piece. Um, so, the, um, the poem is by Baudelaire, it's uh, from uh, 
La Fleur de du Mal, the uh, Flowers of Evil. And it's a poem that I ran into in, a, in a, uh, an essay uh, by uh, Giorgio Agamben. And he points out that the poem is about what we could call um, a writer's block. But it's a more general thing, and that's what the essay was about, that, that even the, uh, the, the uh, monks in the Middle Ages uh, would feel this, this not knowing what to do and not wanting to do anything, but uh, certainly hoping that you would want to, to do something. It, it's, uh, it's very, <laughs> I don't know if I'm making any sense with it, but uh, the poem is, uh, is very um, sensual in, in sensual in that way, and it, because it's, um, it's a devil. So the devil, it's, uh, and that's what the monks uh, thought of, that this was a, a, a sin. It was the devil eating you, uh, eating at you from, from inside. Um, so the nasal sounds, uh, the, the choice of a, of a French poem was, was, um, was a compositional choice uh, because that the sounds in that language are just uh, really worth exploring. And with four voices um, and nothing else, uh, that's, uh, that was a very interesting atmosphere for that. So the, the uh, nasal voices, uh, sounds that Amanda was, um, was making reference to uh, come from the word sun, um, sun says, that's the first, uh, first two words in the poem. So I spent a lot of time in the um, song, right? Uh, and in fact, I was thinking that when I was thinking of you guys or of us, it was like, wow, if this is how long it's taking for one word, you look at the text. <laughs> but no, I promise you the next, the rest of the text goes by more quickly. So I, I, there's a, there's a lot of um, of uh, things that, that at least when I was writing uh, were the most important thing. You you always find out that uh, in in the experience of listening that may not be as the, the same. Like things that were more um, easy or, or straightforward when you were writing turn out to be the main the main uh, thrust of the listening experience. And of course, Scarlatti was easy to write. <laughs> it's such a be beautiful piece. That 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 might be the one that's uh, that's um, uh, the the main um, effect in listening. That wasn't um, the main thing uh, for me composing. So um, I am as curious as as, as everybody here. I don't want to give up, give off the idea that uh, that uh, that I didn't know what I was doing. I think I did, <laughs> but but I, I really look and look forward to seeing what what you guys thought of, of how your experience was. So thank you for being here. And yeah. Thank you, Queens, and, and yeah. thank you, Tac. Good, any other questions? Thank you, this may be a dumb question, but I'm concerned, sitting in the audience, that I'll be able to appreciate the music without knowing what is actually to expect. So, in your, some of your discussion, you brought in the concept of colors. And when that triggered my mind to think of art, so can you possibly relate to what, I, what to expect in terms of art, for instance, colors? You could be expressionistic, or colors basically uh, give you the expression. You could be impressionistic. You could be abstract, where, or is it a combination of everything? So I just want to kind of go in there and say, this is what the, I'm going to expect, because right now I really don't have a good idea. Well, I think I need at least 30 seconds to think about that, but I'll stall and say that that is not a dumb question. I'm super <laughs> excited by where that could go. Okay, you th you, I'll let you stall. You talk. Okay, okay I'll, can I, I'm going to go through in order. So, Gilda Lyons, I would say Gilda Lyons is like a woven, very bright, day glow colors, woven, fab woven fibers. And I'll describe Laura Steinberg as like, imagine what it would look like to see what Carl Sagan imagined. Um, like sci-fi close harmony. Um, David Lane, the colors, I would imagine it's like misty forest landscape, that kind of thing. Imagine walking through the woods and thinking about a very ancient troubadour type of atmosphere. Um, the Dust Bowl set, it's, it's like, um, folk music kind of put in a blender. Some of it's going <laughs> to sound kind of recognizable, and then some of it's going to be more abstract and shaken up, but it's it all surrounding that kind of atmosphere. And then Federico's piece, imagine walking like a, a Renaissance 
like a Renaissance mural in, in an old mm. Italian kind of castle. That's how I think of that piece. So basically, it goes through all of the art. Classical, <laughs> the abstract. All the art. All the time. Impressionistic, impressionistic, so it covers it all. And the other thing is, it's okay if you don't like things. I go to a lot of concerts and I don't get it. And I think that's okay. We can allow ourselves to not like things and to not get things, especially our first time hearing it. I think giving myself permission allows me to listen with a more relaxed, with more relaxed ears. You want to tackle the okay, we'll, okay, we'll take turns with our program. Aaron Gee, Mouthpiece 28. I think that piece is like, it's maybe like a dark installation where you walk into, I'm, th I'm thinking of a thing I saw years ago, like you walk into a big drill hall and it's totally dark and you see like a couple spots of light and you have to walk towards them and figure out what they are. That's kind of the feeling yeah. that I get from Mouthpiece 28. And then in only the words themselves, yeah, only the words themselves mean what they say is kind of an interesting one because there are three movements which have very distinct separate sound worlds, so maybe they all mm -hmm. get their own little um, art placard. Um, but one thing that only the words reminds me of, I used to, my aunt, or my aunt, my grandma, is a painter, and we, we used to go um, to the art museum, and if I didn't like something, she would make me like go like this and look at it really close up, really small, and there's parts in only the words that make me remember doing that to different um, Kandinsky paintings when I was a kid. And you know, you see these things and you're like almost overwhelmed and like, you know, you get this like this ream of emotion and you're like, I don't know what to do with all that. And then you like focus in on these really small particles of like togetherness or collision or just like a splotch of color and then you move on to a different corner of the painting. That's kind of what um, only the words makes me think of. Oh, I totally think it's like three portraits Ooh. of like three different women and they're like, yeah, wow. It's so <laughs> <laughs> well, you got options for that one. Series and posture, I think, is like a big canvas with like expressionistic like slashes of color and a few like pretty, pretty parts. <laughs> <laughs> Um, Deseo. Deseo by Ashkan Bazadi. This kind of, um, it kind of reminds me of a really beautiful, ornate, maybe what we think of when we think of like certain like, um, you know, chapel ceiling type um, paintings, but, you know, kind of a little muted by age, like crumbling around the corner, something really ornate, but something also kind of like at odds with its external environment. Amalgam, that's kind of a, a tough one. I don't know. It, it feels similar to mouthpiece to me. It's like a space that you have to walk through and understand. Maybe it's like a Richard Serra sculpture. Oh, yeah. 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 <laughs> and you can like just peer around the corner slowly and, and it never ends. something happens and you're not even sure if it happened or not. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> 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 that's Good answer. Is that <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. That was such an evocative question. Yeah. Are there any other questions? I think I'd like to thank everybody for the great questions and also um, our musicians for joining us. And we're going to let them go, but uh, please join me in thanking them for joining us today. Thank you, guys. Thank you.